Hello, everyone, to another online event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our friends from the Software Crafts Romandie Group. Hello, everyone. My name is Peti Koch. I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland. And my name is Alexander Kuva, and I'm the host from uh, Software Craft, Craft Romandie. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Adrian Bolboaka today. Hello, Adrian. Hello, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Nice, nice that you're here. It's a pleasure because in the spring, Alex, your brother was here. Now you're here and uh, I, I know you're doing really great stuff and I'm looking forward to the talk. Thank you. So before we start, I have prepared a couple of slides with some general information about today's event and our communities. Um, first of all, a big thanks to our sponsors from the Java User Group Switzerland for their ongoing support, and, uh, which helps us um, to do these events. Then uh, you as participants, you have on the top right side, there's uh, two chat, two tabs. Uh, one is for the chat, where you can write in, for example, where are you from? Um, like Marcus Filon just did. Um, and then there's the question and answer tab where you can post your questions and you can also upvote interesting questions. We will then uh, pick up your questions and uh, Adrian will try to answer it. Um, we'll uh, answer the questions uh, at the end uh, after the talk then if you want to get in touch with the community of the Java User Group Switzerland, uh, feel free to use the Slack workspace. You see here the URL and the screenshot. And for the Software Crafts Romandy community, there's a meetup page. Yes, sir. And from this community meetup, uh, you have access and you can see all the events. Uh, um, every month we have a French uh, speaking event with speakers and other stuff that will come next year. Uh, the next speakers will be um, um, Rudolf. He will present a subject around um, Cypress. Uh, and then later in, no in uh, December, we're gonna have, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, I forget his name, sorry. <laughs> sorry, but he's uh, behind uh, Artisan Developer France. He's very famous in the podcast in uh, French speaking event. Um, and at the end of the year, we have a surprise and uh, you will see it. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Then we will try to record the session and uh, if everything is okay, then it will be later available on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Then there's also YouTube channel for Software Crafts Romandy with the published videos. And if you're interested in upcoming e events, just join the meetup group of SCR and or join the mailing list of the Java User Group Switzerland. I post here some screenshots to, uh, to show you how we, this works. Then after the talk and the question and answer part, uh, we have the possibility to have a chat with each other. It's really a nice way to interact. Uh, feel free to join us and um, you will automatically be redirected to wonder.jock.ch uh, after the, the big marker session is is finished and we're looking forward to meet you there if you're interested and have time and that's everything i wanted to say at the beginning and i hand over now to adrian for for his talk okay can you see my screen now perfect yes thank you all right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I want to talk about 
pair programming and remote pair programming to you. Um, um, would we have like 30 minutes or so, or uh, is it more if uh, just to, to make sure I'm in the time box? Uh, we have announced about one and a half hours for uh, the talk, including questions and answers. So we have plenty of time. Oh, good. No need to hurry. So I have a lot of stories, but um, I don't want to bore you with uh, a lot of things that happened. I also, I'm not a very keen, um, uh, let's say, um, fan of, of slides. But in this, these online meetings, um, I think uh, you want to see something as well, not just myself. So that, that's why I made something. Remote pair programming, for me, it's, it's a very interesting experience that started very early, let's say almost um, since I started in, in university when I, I started, uh, uh, well, learning and improving my, my programming skills. And so it happened that typically we were trying to work together. We didn't know what we were doing as students, but we were working together. And that was very interesting in a way because it formed my appetite for wanting to do this more. And that's why I call remote pair programming a type of social programming because you can do programming alone in, uh, in your corner and that's great. And you can do programming with other people like pairing with people or doing um, ensemble programming or what was formerly known as mob programming, when you have a group of people programming together. The only issue is that you can have a bad experience with this type of social programming, either in a pair or in a group. And this, the, this issue will make you not want to pair more. And there are many reasons why this happens so that you don't have a good experience. It can happen that maybe it's not the time or maybe you didn't find the right people to start off with or it wasn't the context. People were very focused on delivery, delivery, uh, focused on the time box and so on uh, or deadlines. So remote per programming is a part of this social programming par, uh, idea because especially now where during a pandemic and uh, or well even before when i was working with people far away from i don't know united states or canada or so on it's nice to be able to work with someone even at this distance without the the need of a necessary traveling together if you just want to do this let's say i don't know one hour a week or two hours a week just to learn from each other or to improve things so social programming can mean pair programming can mean remote pair programming can mean ensemble programming or remote ensemble programming and it's great if it's done right and and use well. And now I, I will tell you what means done right and use well in my view after some history. I could say that I have been pairing, like really pairing, not what I was doing as a student, just do not just learning or I don't know, trying to, to work together on homeworks and so on. Uh, probably I've been doing that for over 10 years, maybe 15, I don't know, something around that area. It's blurry because as I said, it began gradually and I could, couldn't could put my finger on it, but it's somewhere in that area. And I've been pairing with um, a lot of people on a lot of areas. Um, of course, I started pairing with programmers, but I then liked to learn more about testing. So I started pairing a lot with testers and I wanted to see what they're doing and how and, and why they are behaving like that and trying to destroy my beautiful code, which was perfect. It wasn't, but still that, that was the feeling. So I wanted to understand their point of view. 
And that was my idea. I wanted to pair with testers and then I wanted to see more about what testers are doing and paired even more, even more until I learned a lot from them. And then I started pairing with business analysts to understand how they analyze uh, a business or or even with uh, with um, other analysts, like uh, more technical analysts and so on. And after a while, after becoming, let's say, a bit more knowledgeable in these areas of programming and, and uh, software development, I also started being part of a community like what where we are here and i started facilitating but not necessarily as one but as a few people what uh, what our hosts are doing now so they are uh, facilitating in in a group and i started doing that for for events which was great because i didn't feel the pressure of having all that a burden of, of having an event on my shoulders there was a backup and for me it was a really re a real relief if something happened or I, I just couldn't be there I knew that the event was going to happen or if it, it happened that I didn't have enough time to do something my pair would pick up from the activities and so on so we would balance and still have the work done which is in fact what could happen also with pair programming or with pairing with testers or with analysts or anyone. And after that, I also thought it's a good idea to write a book. And it was the moment when I was facilitating a lot of code retreats and I uh, started writing a book on code retreat with my, with my brother. And that's how we, uh, I, I was part in pair writing. And also for organizing events, I have been organizing many events for the last 15 years or so. Not necessarily only programming events. I also like hiking and and skiing and going into nature and and backcountry skiing and so on. So all, also for those, I would try to organize with someone because I I like to uh, get rid of my blind spots when, when something is, is needs to be done so this is in a way a glimpse of what i call social programming and this is a bit of history but i've been pairing in many other things that's why there are some uh, small dots there at the bottom so i could say that you can pair with anyone on anything if you want to uh, it's just that you need to be open to that and that's maybe the most difficult thing that people are different and they do diff things in different ways and in, in the beginning the first touch is what are you doing why are you doing it like that you shouldn't do it like that and sometimes it's, it's right sometimes it's wrong it's just that you have been doing things in a way but in fact, there's a better way and you can learn from it. But our first experience is just reject that uh, other way of, of doing things. And yeah, I, I learned that first of all, I need to listen. I, le I need to understand what the other person wants to do and how they're doing. I need to try it. I need to try the other approach. And then uh, we can discuss. We can discuss what was my way, what is their way, what's, what can become a better way, maybe um, by taking best out of, of both ways. Now about remote pair programming. Somewhere in 2016, I started recording codecasts on remote pair programming with people I was so I I have this idea, I had this weird idea of starting to pair with strangers. My, I have paired with so many people I have never met in real life. Uh, and just because I have uh, just a place where people can, can ask me, pair with me. And some of those sessions were recorded and are now on YouTube. 
because that's what my my partner agreed on on that to record the session but many of them haven't been recorded and after a while of of pairing the pandemic came and pact publishing came to me and they said okay we want to write a book about remote pair programming so uh, i spent like six seven months on writing this book practical remote pair programming which is in a way my experience about remote pair programming what i have done is i began pairing with people i know and then gradually got out of my comfort zone more and more i started pairing with people at conferences and then remote pairing with people i i didn't know at all which is extremely interesting because i still don't have a reason why or i still don't have an explanation but always when i paired with people i don't know we succeeded to pair well we learned something from each other uh it was very a very nice experience and there weren't any incidents because this idea of starting to pair with with strangers is kind of scary for anyone but i didn't have any bad experience so i don't know why that happened some friends told me that it's a kind of a filter that already if people want to to sign up on a list to pair with me uh, they already want to do this quite badly but still it's interesting to see and maybe you want to experiment and maybe you can discuss if if you had done that before in your in, in the past what was your experience when when pairing with strangers anyway what's interesting is that when you have such a let's say open slot every week to pair with people you don't know you you get to pair up with people from all over the world and you get immediately into something something that you want to do something that you want to try that's also a thing that i never have a very clear, strict agenda on what i want to do during these learning or get to know each other sessions i just ask my pair what do you want to do maybe i have one or two backup ideas but almost never uh, it never happened that it was my idea i didn't want to push that i want to work on my code or on my project and so on i was just part of my partner's idea and maybe that's one of the reasons why it was so easy now pairing for me was always about sharpening our knowledge it's one of those very interesting approaches with, uh, with work where you get to do something and you get to learn something that's why i call this collaborative work so collaborative work means that we work together and we learn from each other we sharpen our knowledge but we still be able to produce something which is really interesting but if you look at it from a broader sense of view if you look at it from the idea of knowledge work people who use knowledge and their brains to produce something to have a, a, an end product that's what all all people who work in knowledge work do uh, if you think about uh, anything from i don't know uh, a lawyer who starts thinking about laws and helps their uh, their clients if you think about a teacher or if you think about a doctor all these people work with knowledge but also have need to have other skills as uh, i don't know a surgeon needs to use very well their hands we still need to know how to use a keyboard but that's not the key thing the the key feature you still you need to have a lot of knowledge to be able to do something that you do and as with the the tasks that we do become more and more complex 
of course that we need to collaborate because there isn't any one person who knows to, how to do everything. And that's why collaboration is essential, but not in the sense of, I don't know, waterfall where you just uh, give specs around and nobody talks to anyone. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but you know what I want to say. But in the way of really sitting down together and, and working, taking it from point A F and to, to point B. And that was always something that I liked, working with people and seeing progress. That's why collaborative work with any type of person, any skill, any anyone, for me is very interesting. It's very interesting also to see how people think from this point of view. I was pairing with people from who do security or I was working on some very interesting hardware and software. I was more of a coach, uh, but they were doing hardware. And I was, I was working for a few months with someone who was doing hardware architecture, which was really interesting. It's a skill that you don't often see. And uh, there are just a few people who do this typically in, in our, an organization. Or the same when you look at security for hardware is something that's quite exotic. So I, I wanted to learn anything that I wanted from, I, I could from them uh, as much as I could. So that's collaborative work. It's, it's very important, but I guess you need to have that curiosity to, to want to learn from the other and at least to understand what's their point of view. That's the first step in, in good quality pairing that you want to understand your partner's point of view. You don't want to steal their knowledge or to, to understand immediately what, what they are doing and why they're doing those steps in that way. But the first thing to collaboration is that you want to have this kind of empathy to understand as I was doing as a, as a junior programmer, I wanted to understand testers, te testers' point of view. Why do they want to destroy my software? In the same way, I'd like to understand the analyst. How are they analyzing this? How are they chunking it into pieces and looking at it uh, from various angles to be sure that they don't miss some details? Uh, the same like working with business people, understanding their needs and how they are looking from a strategic point of view at a, a feature and how we can move on to having a software that works for the business, for our clients, for our users. A collaboration starts when you start understanding your peer and that's very important. The second type of, of um, sharpening way let's say is leveling knowledge and this typically happens all, or almost always happens in my experience as a coach in big organizations where you used to have silos and now you want to move towards more of a cross-functional team and you need to need to level knowledge because you had some people who were over specialized in some areas but they weren't they didn't know anything about other areas. So you need to want to level knowledge. Of course, there are a lot of other situations, but in my experience, this is when it happens mostly when you want to level knowledge. For that, pairing is great because you don't just talk about what you're doing. You don't just explain what you should do. In the same time, you show, you explain, you show, you explain. And that's how you learn. You learn by seeing the other person doing what you, what they are doing and, and you can show what you are doing. So there's this ideally mutual exchange of knowledge and of skills. So leveling knowledge is important is, and, and pairing can do that if you do it, let's say, if you have an organized, let's say, type of pairing, when you want actively to people to pair, 
uh, for getting more people to know about, I don't know, that system or about that area of the system and so on. But you can also have uh, other ideas like round robin pairing, which can be great if people agree to it. So everybody to pair with everybody for a while, uh, but can be also awful if people feel trapped and feel that they are uh, forced into this type of pairing, which isn't great. So don't ever force anyone to do something they don't like. And pairing is can be in that category for for sure. Also, with pairing, you can advance knowledge. You can advance knowledge because, let's say, I want to to learn something that I don't know. And I, I want to, to stay near the person who's smarter than me, better than me, more experienced than me, to advance my knowledge. Or there's another way where we don't know about that thing, but together we can learn faster. And I'm ex I will explain my experience in doing that. When I have a new topic, for me, sometimes it's difficult to start tackling it, to start looking at it, to read all the documentation and to, and to really start working. There's sometimes, you know, for some topics, there's this mental barrier and you always procrastinate and say, okay, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, not yet, just yet. But if you have a partner, what happens is that you have a kind of a self inflicted social pressure because if you say together okay let's start tomorrow to learn together that thing we don't know you need to meet and start working so in a way you can push yourself out of this procrastination mode if you find the right partner who is going to help you get out of, of procrastination, but maybe they, they would do the same. So you can both help each other just by this type of self-inflicted social pressure, which can be weird, but it did happen to me quite often, especially when pair writing, it was really useful to have a pair to help me write a book or an article because we were like uh, pushing each other saying look this is what i wrote please uh, read it give me a review let's let's write this piece together and so on so it's inherently something that can help you and it's not about laziness i'm not talking about that it's just that you feel like you don't know how to start you feel like you're blocked but in fact you just need to put the, the first foot in front and start moving. And there you go. So advancing knowledge is interesting because most of the things I learned, I learned because I was in, uh, I put myself in an environment where I could learn from smarter and more knowledgeable, more experienced people. And I, I would wish that you do the same. And through pairing, you can do that through pair, pair programming, pair testing, pair writing, pair whatever. You can do that. Let's dive more into pair programming. We have these types of uh, uh, of pairs. Okay, so you have the driver navigator, the the typical approach where you have. The person writing the code is the driver and the navigator is, is the person who's watching and, and trying to, to look for strategic movements on a longer phase while the driver is looking at the implementation details. But then you can also have something else. Let's say that you're a coach or a trainer or a facilitator and you have people to train on some topic. Uh, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, it can be anything from a 
programming language to a, a technique like unit testing or test driven development it can be anything and you want to learn to teach these people it's very different when you pair in this way as a trainer or a facilitator or as a coach with a trainee then how you would pair uh, in a driver navigator approach where you just need to go on when you have a trainee in, in front of you you need to make sure that they have a very really good learning experience and they have a, a good step towards understanding so y you don't need to be too pushy to to annoy them and and make them block everything that's coming from you but you don't need to be too relaxed so that they don't learn enough and that's a, a sweet spot that's really difficult to get and it comes with experience how much to push in this uh, uh, sessions with the trainee and how much how and on when to to get back when to relax when you're in a driver navigator approach you maybe want to push more you want to push towards uh, making it um, fine uh, finalizing the task or making making it work uh, but when you're in this situation with the trainee you need to have a very different approach here the focus is learning the focus is having a good experience a good vibe uh, the trainee you'd like you'd like the trainee to want more of it to experience more of it and even when you you will finish your your sessions or your trainings you'd like the trainee to continue with pairing and that's really important i i saw quite a lot of people who have this trauma of pair programming because it was done badly uh, and typically it's in this situation when you are a junior programmer or not necessarily but someone came to you and they even though they were really good good skilled programmers they wouldn't have a good attitude and they would say let's pair and then you have this this stamp of look pairing is something awful that happens is something annoying that happens it's when someone comes with a with an attitude towards me and they tell me i'm wrong and i'm not fast enough and i don't know anything and then when people after a while even after 10 or 15 years they hear about pair programming they say no 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 i don't want to go back to to that that thing when someone was yelling at me that uh, i'm not uh, doing things well enough so that's why when you are a trainer or facilitator or coach you need to understand what big responsibility you have towards the future of of that person the the also the the future career of of the person that you're working with it's a huge responsibility and unfortunately i see quite a, a few programmers don't treat it right that's why i want to mention it anyway you can have as i mentioned before these types of pairs like programmers with testers you can pair with the, with the ui designer or devops or the business analyst probably things that i enjoyed a lot were on on ui design coming from ux so looking at user experience and principles of ux go, going towards creating the design together in a pair that was something that i really enjoyed because if you really want to be close to your user and close to a product that has meaningful aspect to towards your customer you really need to understand the touch point of of your customer that is if you have a user interface if your product has user interface even if you don't have a graphical user interface i guess you still have an api which is a, a user interface but it's not a graphical one it's a programmable uh, user interface and your user is the programmer so you need to think in terms of user experience as well 
to think uh, that you have users that need to use that uh, and they, they need to understand it. They need to get it well and get it right from the beginning. That is probably a thing I learned by looking at the product from the user's point of view and by working quite a lot with, with product managers, with product owners, with, with top management around these areas, with uh, with UI designers, UX, uh, UX designers. And it's really, really important and interesting to, to know and, and to emphasize this. Let's see when pairing helps. Uh, these are from my book. It's, there are a few chapters from my book uh, that I wrote. And of course, they're something I want to present as well now. First of all, you can improve your efficiency. So you can always look at how good you are from a point of view and then pair with someone. And you'll say, hmm, that person is using I don't know which shortcut. I'm going to use that shortcut as well. There you go. You're a bit more efficient. And then you say, hmm, that person is, is using that type of search to understand if we have a type of duplication in between these, uh, these two areas so we can have a faster uh, uh, refactoring. Very interesting. I might do that as well. What I always found interesting is that even when pairing with people who, whom I, I consider that know a lot and, and they are really, really knowledgeable in software development, they always would ask, oh, you're doing that. Hmm, I learned something new. So, you know, people who, who you read, I don't know books from from and, and I, I paired with with some of some of, of uh, people who wrote the, the very basic like say now books of software development and they always have something to learn when pairing, which was in the beginning was very puzzling, and I asked myself, why is this person who seems like they always know what they're talking about? They have 20, 25, 30 years experience. And when they pair, they still say at the end in the in a debrief that this is what I learned. So you can always be more efficient and you can always improve your efficiency through pairing. It's just that you need to stay there to watch your partner, to understand what they're doing and to understand what you are missing and what you can get from your partner that's how you improve your efficiency as a programmer through as i said uh, either a shortcut a, another way of looking at the problem a heuristic that that helps an approach that you wouldn't expect um, a way of, of writing an algorithm that's let's say a lot more functional and OOP that you were not used to. There are so many ways uh, of, of looking at it. It's not that, it's not only that, it's not only about looking at efficiency from this point of view. It's also about trying to always improve yourself. And mm, here all, I think it's an, another slide. I, I'm typically talking uh, uh, about this this story that comes from uh, from Asia. It's about emptying your cup. So it's this story where there's a, 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 a trainee in martial arts and they go to, to the master and they say, okay, uh, master, I want you to teach me whatever my martial arts. And the master says, okay, but here's a cup and starts pouring in the cup a lot of tea <laughs> until it overflows. And the master says, if you want to learn something, uh, you need to empty your cup. So I think that's where 
you need to start from pairing and that's when pairing helps. It's about us trying to empty, empty our cup and trying to understand that we don't know everything. We come with an open mind. We come with, with the real knowledge that we do want to learn something and we will learn something at the end of this however long the, the pairing session is 20 minutes half an hour one hour two hours and that's where it starts from that's where the battering efficiency comes from uh, when when you start with emptying your cup then you can look at it as, as improving technical skills here there are so many things that you can learn like i have learned through pairing about unit testing about test driven development about how to e evolve my code i've done so many pairing sessions probably hundreds of pairing sessions trying to evolve the code in a different weird way so that i i learned what evolutionary design means I I learned quite a, a few things about the differences between object-oriented programming and uh, functional programming because I was pairing on this uh, definite focus. So these are some technical skills I, I, I'm talking about. Of course, you can talk also about programming languages where it's really great to pair with someone who knows the language a lot better than you, and then you will learn it faster. I saw that, that if, if I don't know a programming language and I start pairing with someone I don't uh, who knows the language, I don't have that blockages that, oh, what do I do now? Let's look in the documentation. My partner will tell me. So it's a really great way of learning. And then you will ask probably, but what is the other person gaining? Well, this is very interesting. I learned that when you pair with someone who doesn't know a topic, a programming language, let's say, that uh, newbie will ask very interesting, valuable questions. And then you'll understand how much you really know about that programming language, about that topic, and uh, you start knowing that you need to learn more. That's very interesting. And I learned that especially junior programmers, junior testers will ask questions that are extremely interesting, extremely powerful, even though sometimes they might sound naive, but they are some of the best questions I know. And I try to steal some of them and get back. And sometimes I, I I behave like a junior programmer and I ask the same questions because they they may might be very difficult questions because of their simpli simplicity. When pairing helps, when you want to aid knowledge transfer, that's another uh, very important aspect because there are, as I said, especially when you have these silos and you want to move more towards cross-functional teams, you want to aid knowledge transfer, or when you know you have some area where someone left the organization or someone doesn't want to work on that area anymore, you want to aid knowledge transfer. And I have found out that the best way of doing that is through pairing. Rather than writing documents, writing manuals, writing guidelines. The best thing to do is pair and maybe write that those documents together or write those guidelines together. And there you go, you do pair writing as well. Because when you work, you understand also the practical terms of what you do. And psychologically, you you see things stick up to your brain. It's not just a, a document where you read and it's quite abstract and you don't know where to put it. If you read 
something that you need to do and immediately you do it, it will stick to your brain and you will remember what to do, especially if things were done right. So with the proper tone and the proper attitude in pairing. So these, I find these as uh, deliberate sessions where you have someone who's more knowledgeable at some topic. Let's say you have a system that someone knows better and then someone should also know it because you don't want to have a bottleneck or you, you want to have a backup on that system. So you'd like that person who's knowing a lot to pair for, for the future features with the person who, uh, who you want as a backup. It's, it's that simple, but of course, project managers would say that uh, you put two people on one task, which is kind of silly because we're, we're not, uh, I don't know, producing uh, screws or uh, I don't know, something from the early industrial age. We are working in knowledge work and we need to work together to learn from each other. Another place where pairing helps is improve, uh, to improve communication. I saw that when you start pairing with people, you start understanding what they are doing. I mentioned this before in the beginning when, of my talk. You understand what they are doing and their point of view. So if you, if you worked a bit with the tester, you understand what, what are their concerns. If you worked a bit with uh, a product owner, you'd understand what's their concerns when looking at a new feature or a defect. And in this way, you can have this empathy that's very important when working in a team. If you have the empathy already, you communicate a lot better. Let's say that if you have paired with uh, most of the skill set or the roles in your organization, you will you will stop having this uh, attitude of us versus them, or it was it's their fault. We don't have anything to do with it, and you start talking about this is a situation and this is a solution, or these are the solutions that we can we can take. And you just keep the whole uh, us versus them nonsense and, and skipping the blame and so on, which isn't helping anyone. Uh, there's another aspect of improving communication. If you work with, worked with someone for a while, you know how they react to certain words, certain tones. You know how to treat them so that you can work well together. So it's not just a very dry type of communication that happens. It's also because you have worked closely with someone, then you start understanding what triggers them, uh, what opens them, how to open a discussion and so on. Of course, it is also extremely cultural because I have worked a lot with different cultures and I can say that uh, each culture has their differences. And for some of the differences, for some of the cultures, if you put some to cultures, let's say, if you have this type of multinational uh, big organization, uh, those cultures might react very differently to things that we, we expect normal. So communication in a multicultural team is even, even more difficult. So that's where I think per programming comes even more handier. It's even more important so that you work together well. And here I have a, I have a story where I was a, um, working as a coach we had a, a team with Canadians and uh, Canadians, Americans and Romanians. And there was this programmer who was doing mainly JavaScript, Romanian. And it was really silly that um, every day 
he would overwrite all the code that a programmer, an American programmer would write on, let's say the other part of the day. So he would just say, no, no, this is wrong and, and rewrite most of the code. And then the other programmer would get annoyed and say, why did you do that? And, and this kept happening. So then what I said, okay, you, you two need to pair, but we're so, so big time difference. So I said, okay, but let's find two hours then. Let's find two hours in the day. You will stay a bit earlier, you will stay a bit later and you'll find two hours and let's do this experiment so that you pair together for, for two weeks, every two days, not every day, every two days, two hours. And amazingly, after these two weeks, when they started, they, they paired together, uh, they worked together on the same task, they started getting along and they understood how they should work together. And then it could happen that they would want to pair at, at one moment for some uh, areas, for some they would work individually. So they started understanding when pairing was important and useful for them. And there you go, just with a very minimal investment of, you know, I don't know, 10 hours of pairing, you you solved a problem uh, of, of pro two programmers probably working as uh, as half a programmer because it was so much overwrite and, and code deleting and so on that um, you couldn't imagine. Yes, so this is just, yeah, this, these are just a few aspects of improving communication and how pair programming can work in these areas. Uh, another area where pairing helps is enhancing problem solving capabilities. I'm looking at this especially because I think that this is in a way our habit as programmers to rush into the solution and and uh, maybe it's the education, it's the universities, the school, which tells us that there is a solution coming from math where you have in mathematics, you have just, you know, the solution and that's all. At least that's my experience. But quite often with knowledge work, you need to look at more solutions. You need to look at more types of solutions and you need to understand if your solution is good enough or you need to start looking for more. Way too often I see programmers looking at a, a thing and say, no, no, this is my solution. This is the solution. But I don't know, you need to have at least two or three solutions and to decide on facts, which one is better. That's why when you pair, you start having other points of view and you start understanding that you can look at the problem from a different angle and you enhance your problem solving capabilities. Because, and I, I've done this in the past when I put people who are, were very stubborn on, on their solution and, and pairing together. And from them being very stubborn on this is my solution, this is the solution, the only solution, they started understanding that there are other ways. After a few fights, of course, after uh, a few noise, uh, some noise that happened, but at the end, they they enhanced their problem-solving capabilities and they, are, they were more open to other ideas. I think this is essential when you want to look at analyst, programmer, tester roles where you you need to understand complex systems. Um, and I don't know, I have worked mo mainly in, with complex systems where any solution has uh, pluses and minuses and there isn't the, the best solution. There's always a compromise solution. Okay, and when pairing helps as well by simplifying the existing code base. When you want to look at the code base and 
you want to have less code, you want to have clearer code, less duplication, you want to, to maximize the power of your abstractions. It's very important to look at it from this point of view, but of course you need to start from the idea that it's not my code, it's not my child, it's our code and we need to look at it and we need to improve it. We need to simplify it the best we can and then look at it more. Uh, that's like, okay, the, the craft attitude of always trying to sharpen uh, your skills to have the best product that you can and then learn more how to make it even better. In a pair, you can do that because you have these points of view. And I'd like to see also not only programmers uh, in this type of uh, task of simplifying the existing code base, but also I'd like to, to see what, what analysts think about this, what, what testers think about this. At one moment, I was having a workshop on um, a workshop called or taking the user experience principles and applying them to the to APIs. So it was something like uh, user experience for APIs. And at one moment we created this API and during the workshops, in fact, it was kind of a, a real workshop where we were creating their real API for the system and learning how to do it in the same time. And at one moment I started doing what uh, UX, what a UX test does. So taking people who don't know your system and you put them in front of the screen and you give them a task. A task means, okay, this is, uh, I don't know, banking uh, system, there you go, make a payment. And you don't help them at all. You just give them this task. There you go, make a payment. We were doing the same with the API, but we didn't take a programmer. We took a tester and asked, look, you're a tester. There is, this is the API. There you go, you need to make this call. Of course, the person knew the business. They, they were knowledgeable enough to know how to do this. And very interestingly, they, the, that tester blocked in some areas. And then we start asking, why did you do that? There you go, these, these are the reasons. And we understood that the API wasn't clear enough. That led to the need to simplify the existing code base, starting from the comments from the API. So you, need, you can have various approaches to pairing through collaboration when you simplify the existing code base. Okay, there are some good pair programming techniques and a bad one in this list. <laughs> uh, driver navigator, we talked about it. Pairing trainee, we talked about it. Beginner advanced is when you're not a, 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 a coach or... A, so I, if, let's say I don't know anything about Rust, I'm a beginner and I go to someone who's an advanced programmer in Rust and I want to, let, let's pair and, and you could teach me. It's a very big difference with the pairing trainee where a trainee typically is a junior programmer who doesn't know a lot about anything. But this beginner advanced doesn't mean, it doesn't refer to your general skills as, as a programmer, but it refers more to your uh, specific skill on uh, set skill set on a topic. It's really useful, it's really nice if you find that good mentor and I learned so much through this approach by with beginner advanced. Typically I try to put myself in the beginner shoes and, and get someone who knows a lot more than me, someone who's smarter, more experienced, and I learned I learned quite a lot, even in a very short time frame. So sometimes in a two hour very intense pairing session, you can learn more than I don't know, a few days or a few weeks of trying it uh, on your own. If you have a good person, if you have the good topic, the, the, the appropriate mindset, 
you can learn so much in this way. Um, there's one beginner beginner, which I sometimes see used. So you put, uh, you put people who are beginner at the topic or the same with uh, juniors it would be something like trainee trainee. And I say, okay, you do something there. Um, and then we'll talk to you in a week. I saw this happening, uh, especially with new hires so from university typically who especially in very busy organizations are lost somewhere in a corner and nobody takes care of them. And yeah, there you go. They don't learn much. They don't understand what's going on. So it's kind of a time lost for everyone. Uh, so it's just a bad approach. If you do take a trainee, please take care of them. If you take a junior programmer, take care of them as much as you can. Then you have ping pong pair programming, which is in two ways. Maybe you've done it, maybe you've used it. Uh, one way is when you have test-driven development and you have um, a person who writes the test and then the you give the test uh, written, it can compile, the code can compile, you give to the other person who will implement the test and make it green and then write the next test and give it back to the the first person and so on. So you have this ping pong in between the two pairs. And there's another approach when you have a time box. So you have like five minutes, I'm pairing five minutes, you're pairing five minutes and so on. It's useful to have a kind of a equal, a balanced approach when in between pairs. It's very useful and very nice, but there are more other techniques as well. I won't go more into them, but we can discuss further if you have any questions. Uh, there are some pair programming styles. The first one I call unplanned pairing is the thing where that everybody does in, I think, any type of knowledge work. You don't know someone and you go to someone who knows that and you sit at the desk or now being remote, you ask on on your chat, can you help me with this? You do a screen share and, or you, you put on a, a tool. We'll talk a bit later about tools and you talk start talking about your problem. This is unplanned pairing. It happens with lawyers, it happens with doctors, it happens with teachers, it happens with students, with programmers, with testers, with anyone who does any type of knowledge work. That's unplanned pairing. Uh, it's good, it's necessary, but it can be a lot more improved through these, uh, um, these techniques that I, I told you about. Then you have the traditional pairing, which is basically based upon driver navigator and ping pong and, and so on. This is for me traditional pairing. Then you have elastic pairing, which is something very interesting um, that I learned from one of my pairs in, uh, in the remote pair programming sessions that I've done in, uh, and you can find it on YouTube as well, uh, with Ferdinando Santa Croce. Uh, we were pairing in a way which was very interesting and it was his and his team's approach when they weren't necessarily doing ping pong, they were more like grabbing the keyboard whenever someone had a good idea. And that's, I think, a very good approach with experienced programmers, uh, grabbing the the keyboard and trying to do to have this um, this task or or trusting that the other person will, will do whatever you need to do. Elastic pairing is very interesting because it's. It's like the difference between a very strict planning and an agile approach, or I don't know how to, to explain it. It's it's the just looking into your partner's eyes and saying, 
I know how to do this. Let me do it. And you take a few minutes and show and say, hmm, interesting. Let's discuss upon it. But I can do it like that. You grab the keyboard and take and, and try it as well. It's elastic because you use the people, the, the, the pairs to adjust, uh, to adjust the solution depending on what they see. Um, it's not strict, it's based on trust, it's based on experience. And I find that it's one of the most effective and one of the most, uh, uh, one of the, the tech, the, the styles that brings most joy to me at least. Because it did happen working like that. I didn't see the day. Uh, passing by, just pairing like that. And so we could pair for hours, and we we would say, oh, well, how how did these two hours uh, go? Uh, we really need to to stop and you know move a bit. We sit we have uh, sit for too long uh, in this uh, desk. So it's really rewarding and it's really effective as well. You can produce really nice solutions because of trust and because uh, of experienced programmers. And then you have strong style pairing, which is more or less the the creation, or yeah, more I would say, is the creation of Well and Falco, who use this a lot in in um, mob programming, now called ensemble programming, and. It's the idea that you you have the driver who's just a smart keyboard, and the navigator would say through some types of, some type of very clear instructions what the the um, driver needs to do. It's well in style. It's interesting. It can be useful. It's really useful when you would need to tackle very complex situations or when you have that navigator who is extremely knowledgeable in all sorts of areas, but doesn't know the exact syntax of the thing, but the driver knows the syntax. So it comes from an area where the, the coach, the trainer is extremely knowledgeable about coding and sees the code in a very deep way through x-rays but doesn't really know your syntax. Or even if they know that the syntax, they don't want to get lost into writing the syntax. They want to focus on the strategy of moving towards something. And sometimes it happens with strong style that they just try out things. So the, the, how Llewellyn is putting it, I'm just trying out things and I don't know exactly where I'm going, but just bear with me and have trust that we'll go somewhere. It's a weird style for some people. It's a very exhilarating style for other people. I must say that it's interesting to try, but with an open cup, so be open to it. It's not that easy. Just a few words about communication methods. It's really important not to be aggressive. I would like people not to be submissive, like say, oh, okay, whatever you want to do. Yeah, you're the boss here, or you're the, you're the more experienced. I'd like people to really tell their thoughts about what's going on, ask questions, be assertive about what they want to do. So these are just, these are psychological concepts, communication concepts. I won't go into it because I might take two hours to talk only about these topics, uh, but it's really important. Please be assertive when talking in a pair. Use the right words, right tone, and be clear. Especially when you're remote, clarity and using the right words is very important. Also how you pronounce words, how, which we, it, it's a lot more important because being remote, you lose a lot of the bandwidth, uh, communication bandwidth, because of all these tools that we use. Um, uh, it, it's easier to talk in person. Some best practices with pair programming. 
especially with remote pair programming. First of all, take notes. I like to take notes, okay? I have some notes here, <laughs> a lot of notes. <laughs> and they come from different sessions i have a pen and i have some paper that's my style some people write to write or like to write on their laptop um i don't know however you like it but take notes it's important to take notes during your session and at the end you'll you'll see look um these are these were my um uh, ideas so that the fourth thing here on the best practice is the debrief if you take notes during the session, the debrief is very fast and easy, and and it will help a lot with everything, with improving your your approach, your session, uh, your collaboration, your pairing. Also, take notes with things that you like to things that you you would like to learn, things that you want to focus more on. Second, start with small talk. That's something that. I saw that is very important, especially with the, as we Romanians are Lat, uh, 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 Latin cultures, okay? We like to speak a bit more, you know, what, what you are doing and so on. It's the same with, with other cultures that are Latin and so on, but it's not necessarily like that. I saw it for us, it's, it's necessary, but, uh, maybe for others it's not, other cultures is not. But take it with a grain of salt, but still I, I'd say that start with small talk is, is nicer. You you warm the room a bit. Don't don't rush into the uh, to the topic. Empty your cup. We talked about this before, so it's really important to to start with an open mind. The debrief happens at the end of each session. For me, it's really important. It's the moment when we talked about what we are doing. We talked about what we learned from each other, what we found awkward, what we'd like cha to change for the next session, if there, there will be a next session, or even if it won't, we would still like to, to end up with some improvements. Dialogue courtesy, for me, that's really important don't talk on top of each other. For me personally, that's annoying. If someone stops me, I try to talk, uh, I try to have a short explanation, brief, but to have everything there. So uh, I don't want to get long into my explanation. That's also dialogue courtesy, but try to, to keep it short. Don't cut your, your partner, wait. And then maybe ask some questions. Start with clarify, questions to clarify. Did you mean this or uh, what do you mean by that? And then state your point of view. That's really important when you want to have meaningful conversations on, on, on a topic. Building confidence, commit often and good unit tests. That's uh, important to commit often. And if you have if you have the need or if you write good unit tests, you build confidence through this tooling, through this approach, through this. Uh, yeah, for me, there's, these are tools, committing and, and good unit tests. You have the confidence that you're in a safe, spa uh, safe spot and you can move forward. And trust your pair. I think we talked a lot about trusting the pair and it's just a thing you need to do. Now about remote pair programming setup. So if, because we talk about the remote as aspect, first of all, uh, for it, it's weird that some people looked at it uh, and, and read my book and I'm talking uh, extensively about a setup with good lightning, good internet connection, a good microphone. Well, this, okay, it's, it's not the most expensive microphone, but you can hear me well enough, I hope. Uh, a good HD camera to see me, to see my expression, to to see if I'm smiling, if I'm annoyed or whatever. And also I have computers here. So I'm using one computer to, to look at my pair uh, and then another computer to write the code. I'm having two computers because it's an, it annoys me when all these video, 
uh, communication takes a lot of the CPU when I need to build or when I need to do whatever. So that's why I want two computers, even with the best computer, with the best uh, CPU, with the best memory, still, if you have a laptop and you have HD, you have camera, you have microphone, uh, you have maybe a screen share and you have a code editor, it will go slowly. And for me, that's annoying. So that's why I prefer two computers. Anyway, if not, at least two monitors, you do need that. Good lighting is important because you want to be able to see your partner well, not in the dark or not with a very bright light in the back so that you don't see anything. Or as we call it in, call it in photography, contre jour. So that's a very important aspect of per programming setup and don't please don't forget about it. And then about remote aspect, there's this debate because between screen sharing and remote pairing tools. Of course, when I started off per programming, there I used TeamViewer. It was the only one, uh, the only tool that we could use for screen sharing. And uh, which is free. Okay. Yeah, but then a lot of these tools appeared, which are um, maybe better, faster, use less bandwidth, like AnyDesk, Screen, Zoom, Google Meet, Skype, and so on. But still, you don't have a very good experience. So they are cumbersome to use when you want to have uh, this feeling like you're near someone, near a programmer, you, you want to use the code editor. So that's why there are these remote pairing tools, which are a lot better. I didn't find any one of them being perfect. I think they all can be improved. And I know that many of these uh, tools are getting improvements. So maybe in a few years we'll have a tool that will be really great. Like how I would think about code editors you know, it took a few years, quite a few good years until you have a code editor, which is really great. But all these tools, top of Visual Studio, um, used together, code share, there are more tools of remote pairing. You could try them and see which one you like more. I liked all of these, but any one of them has pluses and minuses, let's say. And I don't want to go more into making this a tool review session. Uh, probably it also depends on your needs and it depends on which code editor you use, security, which is very important. And especially when you work in, a, in an organization that has very strict security rules, it can become difficult to use uh, these tools. So, I understand the constraints, but still we need to move to this uh, age when we can remote pair. And yeah, any type of this remote pair programming tool, I think uh, should be checked from a security point of view as well. So that was all my, anything, or every, anything that I wanted to say now, of course, I could go on for a few hours, but I will stop now and ask about your questions. Thank you very much, Erien, for your talk and sharing your experiences. Uh, at the moment, we have just one question. So I encourage everyone who has a question, please post that into the Q&A tab. So we'll pick up the one current question from Derek. Uh, you, about, you have talked about pairing with BAs. How does that work? Maybe you can explain a little bit um, the circumstances and... Yeah, um, I I learned from, um, I don't know if you know Chris Matz. Chris Matz, I know that he's, he is called as the, um, the godfather of behavior during the development. Um, so him together with uh, Dan North created the BDD approach and I I met him, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago at an Agile Lean European conference. And we kept talking about different things. And I know from him that this is how BDD started. 
he said, I don't want to have this approach where I I write your the specs and you 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 look at them and you say, oh, something's missing, and then I need to write more specs. And this was investment banking when he where he was working at the moment. Um I said, okay, I want to pair with the programmer to be able to work together. So I'm the BA who knows the business, who knows uh, the intricacies of what we need to do. And the programmer knows how to write the code, knows how to test it, knows how to implement it. And after a while, after trying it in this way, they understood that before really starting to write the code, they need to have conversations. So this is in a way how BDD started because anytime you'd hear Dan North or Chris Matz or Liz Kio talk about BDD, they would say that conversation is most important aspect of BDD. And asking, uh, looking at the problem and asking about corner cases, thinking about what could go wrong uh, even before doing anything. And then you start implementing it, okay? You can start with a test that is a business test. And you literally have the BA sitting there and telling the programmer, look, this is the business test that we'd like to write. Let's write it. Let's see how it works. These are the endpoints. Let's see how we could implement that. And gradually, I think the BA, the BA needs to, to look that we use the business term. So as, as you call it in BDD, it's the... Um, I'm uh, missing the name. Um, so the that the names the the business names from the um, that that you need to have, and they need to exist also in the specs, uh, executable specification that you write, but also in the code. So if you a client means something, you should write client, and not customer. That's uh, that's the idea. And I think it works great. Uh, even like last week uh, with a client that I'm working now, they saw that if you have uh, the, the product owner sitting with the programmer, they get things done a lot faster and they can write specs during this uh, building up. So you don't need to write specs before. You can start writing specs during uh, during writing the code. It works great. You just need to to have a really knowledgeable BA. Thank you very much, Adrian. So we don't have any further question. So um, Alex, do you have something to say? add at the end or to say so i would say thank you very much adrian we will close here with the official part uh, close the big market session and um, move on the discussion onto our wonder.me room thank you very much for coming thank you thank you as well alex saying something <laughs> he's muted <laughs> <laughs> okay i <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> ah. ah, ah, I can turn on now. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Marcus. There's a question now. Ah, yeah, from Christian. Okay. What are the things you should avoid? The pitfalls mm. when doing pair programming? Oh, there's so many. I typically don't want to go into that because there's so, so many of them. Uh, Okay, so the opposite of everything I said. <laughs> so, but the most, I think the, the, the most uh, awkward thing is getting into a fight from the beginning. So saying, no, I should do that. I know how to do this. It's, it's my way. Uh, so I, I don't know a w how to say this with a word, but maybe it's arrogant. At attitude. And... Attitude, yes. Arrogant, aggressive something like that. Uh, I think this is the worst thing that I saw happening over and over. Um, 
then maybe um, uh, there's also not choosing the right um, technique or approach for the skill set that you have. So as I said, you have uh, you can have a, a trainer, a, a trainee, or you have a junior, or you have an experienced person in front of you. Uh, how these techniques help? So choosing a technique that is appropriate for your context. If you if you know that you you have a trainee in front of you, probably you need to to behave more like a a, a trainer. If you know that you have a, an experienced person. Please don't try to 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 use very uh, to behave like a, a trainer. Try to behave more like a, a peer uh, at the same level. I saw this happening also to me uh, quite often. People who are very used to training when I was tra I was uh, pairing with them, they would behave like I was the, the trainee and really giving very small examples and be like, you should do this here, the here. And for me, okay, it, it was weird, but it can become annoying. So some people who are not used to that can become annoying. And it's the opposite. So if you are very experienced and you start having a, a, a junior programmer in front of you and you say, okay, let's implement a strategy and let's do this uh, refactoring then uh, and you know what you do now okay uh, it's way too abstract it's not clear enough so mm, the level of details need to be very clear and need to choose the right approach it's the same with the uh, with the, the strong style pairing which is really useful in some situations especially when you want to go in weird situations you want to go towards a, a solution but when you 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 don't have that type of more difficult approaches i wouldn't personally use strong style llewellyn wouldn't agree with me but that's my approach that's my my point of view uh, it, I think it's fit for some situations where you are searching for some solutions and you don't really know wh where you're going. So it, there, there's so many ways where you, you can go can go wrong. Also the setup. So you don't know the task, you don't know the person, you don't know what you're doing, how you're doing. Uh, you need to prepare a bit. It's like any meeting. You need to prepare on having the source control ready, Having your, I know, camera ready, having your um, uh, code editor ready, and so on. Uh, it can become annoying, you know, to go into a, a pairing session and for half an hour just do setup, or you wait for the other person doing setup. It's it's just, uh, it it feels like uh, losing your time, and maybe it is. So yeah, maybe these are the, the things that come into my head now. Thank you. The one more question from Christian about uh, how much time are you spending at maximum for one pair programming session? Mm. Um, six hours probably, but with with breaks. I don't know a session, what means a session, but I try not to go more than 90 minutes, take a break of 15, 20 minutes and then go back, but uh, yeah, I don't know. 90 minutes is tops if you look at like a bulk session. But if you want to go on, you can go another 90 minutes. But typically like six hours with breaks and everything, it's maximum for me. Okay, thank you very much. So let's stop here and move on to the Wonder Me Does Room. Thank you very much again for coming and uh, goodbye everyone. And see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.